Okay, so we are going to look at uh, chapter nine. This is basically talking about um, temperature and heat. It's called thermal physics and thermodynamics. We're gonna talk about what temperature is, what heat is, and how we can use heat as a form of energy to extract work. So let's start with temperature. How cold is it? How warm is it? What do we mean by temperature? Well, it's actually a little bit different from uh, what we call heat in physics. Uh, the two terms, heat and temperature, really have uh, very different meanings. So with heat, it's a thermal energy transferred from one object to another. So, you know, normally when we think about heat, we think of thermal energy, okay? But for physics, it's very specific. It's thermal energy going from one system or object to another object. Temperature is related to heat and temperature determines naturally which way heat is gonna flow. But temperature is um, really the microscopic kinetic energy, the average uh, kinetic energy molecules have. And therefore um, it determines the way heat flows because when we have more kinetic energy in one system than another, the, uh, the molecules will bounce into one another and interact and sort of equalize the uh, average amount of energy. So as we go up in temperature, the average kinetic energy of the molecules in the room increase. If it's a solid or a liquid, they're vibrating more, they're translating more, they're rotating more. So again, um, heat is thermal energy. Temperature really determines which way um, heat likes to flow, hot to cold. So again, here's a, you know, sort of a stylized picture of molecules moving randomly um, due to, you know, thermal motion. And obviously this is too small for us to see. These molecules are like 10 to the minus nine and 10 to the minus 10 meters across. And the best that we can even see with the microscope is 10 to the minus six. So um, they are moving about, um, as we increase the temperature, they move more. As we decrease the temperature, they move less. Now here, this is a little bit sophisticated. So, you know, we've got to look at this um, with, uh, you know, a little bit of a discerning eye. These are graphs. And what it shows here <clears throat> is a distribution. It's called a Boltzmann distribution. And it shows the distribution of how fast the molecules are moving at different temperatures. Now, this is just a, um, you know, a, a generic collection of molecules in, in, the, in a room. These are air molecules or gas molecules of some sort. And what we notice here is some molecules are moving very slow. Some molecules are very moving very fast. But um, as we heat something up, okay, this curve moves to a higher and higher velocity. So that means that you still have slow moving molecules when um, something is warm, but on average, this you know, peak sort of represents close to the average. On average, they're moving faster and faster and faster. So again, you know, in this room right now around me, I got some slow molecules, I got some faster molecules. If I were to turn up the thermostat, what I would do is shift the average velocity, shift the average kinetic energy that these molecules have to a higher and higher number. So that's important to understand that we can't see this motion, but what we feel is heat is we're actually uh, feeling the impact of the average kinetic energy. Why am I cold if the room is cold? Because my heat, the heat from my body tends to flow out to the room and heat up the molecules around me. Okay, so I'm left cold. If it's very warm, then the heat tends to flow toward my body or I can't get rid of as much heat and then I feel too warm. So again, um, most molecules uh, in these distributions have speeds near the average value. Um, some can even be zero and some can have many times greater. But again, as the temperature of the gas increases, the speed of these molecules is also gonna increase. Okay, so how do we measure temperature? That's been a question that's been around for quite a long time. The first practical 
means of measuring temperature was something called a thermoscope. This was invented by Galileo. He was trying to measure the body temperature of a person. And, um, you know, you put your hands around this, this glass bulb up here. And as the temperature increased, it would push air out of this bulb and this little um, capillary would go down for higher temperatures and would go up for lower temperatures. So again, not really well calibrated, but um, probably not that precise, but here's sort of our, our first um, attempt at uh, creating a thermometer. Of course, we have liquid thermometers. Um, again, not the most precise instruments in the world, but they're good for giving us a rough idea of what the temperature is outside or what the temperature is of uh, some particular um, you know, liquid that we're, we're looking at. Um, and again, the way that they work, it's sort of, it's sort of, it's similar to what Galileo had, this thermoscope. Um, however, the main difference here is it's a bulb of liquid which we're allowing to expand and contract rather than a, um, you know, a bulb of gas, which when heated wants to occupy more volume. So uh, that's the main difference with the modern thermometers. There are also thermometers which are based on, instead of the expansion of liquids as the alcohol and mercury thermometers are, the expansion of metals. This is a bimetallic thermometer and it's really good for ovens because you don't want a liquid in an oven. The liquid can boil, the thermometer can break. In this, we take a um, stronger metal like steel and we weld it to a weaker metal like brass. And weaker metals have weaker bonds. So when you heat them up, they tend to expand more and that causes the brass to expand more while the uh, steel doesn't expand as much. And it'll actually cause the metal to curve. Now, if you wind this in a helical pattern, the helix or the spring will coil and uncoil according to the temperature due to this uneven expansion. And that will drive this little dial right here and tell you what the temperature is. Again, not the most precise thing in the world, but um, when you're cooking something, like you're cooking meat and you wanna make sure it's safe, it does the job that it needs to do. It's precise enough that type of thing. Here's some other thermometers. All we need for a thermometer is something whose properties change as the temperature changes. And therefore we can calibrate these changing properties to some known value, okay? Some known temperature. Um, these right here are also uh, thermometers. These are thermoelectric thermometers, which change their electrical properties, usually resistance, or if it's a thermocouple, it'll actually generate a voltage. But again, by looking at their electrical properties, we can you know, determine what the temperature is. And these actually can be uh, quite precise. You can get a very nice uh, temperature reading from these types of devices. Infrared thermometers, you're probably, um, familiar with these, with these ear thermometers, you can put it right up to your ear canal. And it's a very fast way to measure your body's core temperature. Um, there are also forehead scanning thermometers that do sort of the same thing. But uh, these ear thermometers are a little more precise. And um, unfortunately the text here has to be uh, edited, but um, they work on the principle of uh, you're looking at the thermal radiation and from the thermal radiation, from the infrared light, determining exactly how warm something is. So generally we deal with three different temperature scales. Uh, the first scale is the Fahrenheit scale. That's the US customary units. And the second scale is a Celsius scale. That is the metric scale. And then the final scale is the Kelvin scale. So Fahrenheit scale was developed in 1717 by, as you might expect, GD Fahrenheit. And Fahrenheit set the zero to the lowest obtainable temperature at that time. And to obtain this temperature, what do you do is you'd melt 
salt, I mean, he melt ice with salt. And by saturating the ice, um, the latent heat of the ice melting would actually bring the temperature down and it could reach about zero degrees Celsius. The other point on the scale was set at 96. Um, you know, if you notice, a lot of things back then were di divided into 12. Um, you know, our uh, hours are, you know, divided into 12, one o'clock to 12 o'clock. Uh, so he did the same thing. 96 was divisible by 12. He set the body temperature for human to be 96 degrees. Um, so this, uh, you know, was a very effective um, temperature scale. And we still use it today. Um, so, uh, you know, we credit him with, um, you know, I still use the Fahrenheit scale. I so want to use the metric scale. I, I still haven't been able to train, you know, go, go to the metric scale yet. I, I can do it for, with all the other quantities, but I grew up knowing what 70 degrees Fahrenheit feels like, 80 degrees Fahrenheit feels like, you know, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So I, I can't let go of the Fahrenheit scale. The Celsius scale, um, sometimes it was called the centigrade scale was uh, named after Andre Celsius, who actually came up with a very strange scale. He set 100 to be the freezing point of water and zero to be the boiling point. So his scale was backwards. Of course, when they developed the, the metric system, they, they switched it around. So although Celsius gets credit for coming up with the scale, um, eh, I, uh, I think uh, his scale was a little backwards. Now the last scale is actually the most important scale. This is the SI scale of temperature. And it really connects the idea that temperature is related to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So uh, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, um, was born William Thompson. You know, a lot of these um, people when they receive some royal acknowledgement or title or whatever, uh, would change their name. So he was William Thompson and he was knighted or you know, given the lordship or whatever, uh, but he was given the lordship Lord Kelvin. Um, he was really quite ingenious in terms of coming up with his temperature scale. He studied the uh, properties of gases at different temperatures. What he discovered is that the pressure would vary linearly with the temperature. And this green would represent his, the data that he would see, you know, higher pressure, higher temperature, lower pressure, lower temperature. He then made a really nice extrapolation. And he said, well, if I extrapolate my data backwards for all these gases, okay? Um, and it didn't matter what gas he used, the data would intersect with the x-axis basically you know, when the pressure would go to zero at negative 273 degrees Celsius, okay? And Kelvin said, well, that's a very special point because that would indicate where our pressure would go to zero. And really you can't have a pressure less than zero. That would be the absolute lowest temperature. So Kelvin made that uh, the bottom of his scale, absolute zero. We still call it absolute zero today. And um, again, this absolute zero, which is at negative 273 degrees Celsius, negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit, is a temperature um, which we can't go any lower than. And we'll talk about the fact that we can't even reach zero. We can get very close, but we can't even reach zero. And again, this makes, this makes a lot of sense. If temperature, is related to the thermal motion of what's happening within a gas or whatever, um, we should set the zero point to the point at which theoretically all the motion goes away. Okay, quantum mechanically, we know that even if we could cool it to absolute zero, there would still be some zero point um, energy associated with the movement. But um, again, you know, thinking about negative temperatures like negative 
40 degrees Celsius or negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, negative temperature, you know, doesn't really map well with the idea that temperature is related to the average kinetic energy because we can't have, you know, um, a negative average kinetic energy for these molecules. At zero on these scales, we don't have motion go to zero, okay? The zero for the Celsius scale is based on the freezing point of water. The zero on the Fahrenheit scale is based on a saturated salt solution of water and ice, okay? There's still motion of molecules. So really the Kelvin scale is the one that makes the most physical sense. What is the coldest temperature we've been able to achieve? Well, I haven't looked up this recently, sorry. But the coldest temperature ever recorded um, was obtained using lasers to cool the material off. And this sounds really strange because we think of lasers as heating things up and, and cutting things. But what the lasers do is they actually push on molecules and they're tuned such that any molecule coming toward the laser will be pushed backward. This creates what's called optical molasses. It slows the molecules down, believe it or not, until they're no longer moving, or they're moving very, very little. And uh, the best they've been able to get to, the coldest temperature that they've reached using this method is about one billionth of a degree above absolute zero, okay? Really, really cold, but again, We'll explain why we can't quite reach absolute zero. Here's some fun substances to talk about in terms of different temperatures. The coldest substance uh, that, that uh, we commonly use is something called liquid helium. It's very expensive. Um, this sits at four degrees above absolute zero under normal atmospheric pressure. It's a really bizarre fluid. Uh, once you set it in motion, once you get it flowing, it just keeps floating, flowing forever. This is a, a little fountain of liquid helium. And, um, you know, they put it in this jar and, and the capillary attraction gets to flow upward and it just keeps flowing out of this bottle forever. It's what we call a superfluid. And uh, it's very unique due to its low temperatures. Liquid hydrogen is liquid around 20 degrees Kelvin. Liquid oxygen is about 90 degrees Kelvin. And both are used for, for rocket fuel. Um, liquid hydrogen and oxygen were burned on the shuttle's main engines. Uh, most rockets today actually use liquid oxygen and either liquid methane or liquid kerosene, or usually liquid kerosene. Uh, liquid methane will be used in, in uh, more recent rockets. Getting a little warmer, liquid nitrogen is oftentimes used to preserve biological samples at 77 degrees Kelvin. Very few um, chemical reactions will happen so that if you have a biological sample, you can keep it fairly inert for a long period of time at that temperature. Liquid nitrogen is fairly inexpensive, but um, if you can't afford liquid nitrogen, there's solid carbon dioxide, what we call fro uh, dry ice. This is 195 degrees Kelvin. That's considerably warmer than liquid nitrogen, but it's still cold enough to preserve things uh, fairly well. Um, you know, if you have something in your freezer, you know if it's in your freezer too long, which is around zero degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it will degrade over time. So that's why we have these colder materials to keep things uh, stable for a longer period of time. Water, of course, freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100 degrees. Our body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, although there's some dispute about that. And uh, if you want the Celsius scale, we're 37 degrees Celsius. If you want Kelvin, then uh, we're roughly about 310 Kelvin. All right. So now we're going to go to a lot of things that are uh, much higher temperatures. Here we have the different um, melting points of um, metals. And uh, what we can see is uh, tungsten melts at the uh, highest temperature. I've got to make some corrections here. Not all of this is correct. 
And um, that's why we're using light bulbs. Uh, the filament in the light bulb will glow due to its very high temperature and uh, give off both infrared and visible light. The sun, you wouldn't want to visit the sun. Not only is the surface of the sun incredibly hot, um, lots of radiation, and uh, you know the gravity would crush you on the surface of the sun. Um, you'd vaporize instantly. You wouldn't feel a thing. At 5,600 degrees Kelvin, um, it glows mainly in the visible because of its very high temperature. Lightning is actually hotter. Uh, both uh, plasma arc welding and lightning is about twice as hot as the surface of the sun. Well, about 10,000 degrees Kelvin as opposed to 6,000 degrees. Um, but as hot as the surface of the sun is, the middle of the sun is even hotter. Here we're getting into tens of millions of degrees or over 10 million degrees. This is a hot enough temperature with a nuclei of atoms will come together and fuse, uh, to, well, hydrogen will fuse into helium at those incredible uh, temperatures. Thermonuclear explosion, which is based on the fusion of hydrogen, will reach temperatures of 100 million degrees. So as hot as the core of the sun is, we've actually created destructive forces at even higher temperatures. And one of the reasons why nuclear weapons are so destructive, you know, we usually just think of the radiation because it, it can be uh, fatal. But uh, the destructive force actually comes from the heat, the very high temperatures of the fireball, when it first forms, causes this uh, hot material at 100 million degrees Kelvin to expand outward until it can no longer expand anymore. And the fireball will go upward and create this classic mushroom cloud. So the heat of, from the fusion creates a very intense fireball and this fireball um, will radiate um, you know, thermal energy, basically destroying um, a lot of different things and creating a shock wave that will also create massive destruction. On a larger scale um, than uh, particle accelerators, the Z machine, which is in Sandia National Labs, holds the record for hottest plasma ever created at uh, 2 billion degrees of Kelvin. That's 3.6 billion degrees Fahrenheit. We're talking about they take these very thin uh, tubes of material and uh, heat them uh, to these very high temperatures. Um, going to hotter temperatures when stars explode, much more massive than, than our own sun, uh, their temperatures can be about 10 billion degrees. But um, we've actually been able to um, reach um, extremely high temperatures on an on a atomic scale using um, the Brookhaven National Laboratory right out on, on Long Island. And uh, that smashed gold nuclei together and reached temperatures, and again, it's microscopic, of one trillion degrees to try to see what um, you know, the universe was like very, very early on. Oh, the uh, CERN uh, proton, anti-proton collider um, has reached even hotter temperatures, but on, a, on smaller um, scales, it's reached uh, about 10 trillion degrees. And um, this is again to simulate what the universe was like very early on. Nothing is ever gonna reach a temperature as early on when the universe formed. Um, when the universe formed, energy densities were nearly infinite, so temperatures were nearly infinite. But since then, the universe has expanded and it's cooled, and now we're down to about two degrees Kelvin. Okay. Um, just a side note, you should know how to convert temperature. Uh, to get Celsius from Kelvin, we're just uh, subtracting off 273.15 degrees. The Celsius and Kelvin scale are just offset by that absolute zero. Zero for Celsius starts at the freezing point of water, which is for Kelvin, 273.15 degrees Kelvin. 
For Fahrenheit, it's a little more difficult. You have to take nine fifths of the Celsius temperature and add 32, or for Celsius, take the Fahrenheit temperature, subtract off 32 to get the zero, and then multiply by five ninths. And again, here's some quick uh, conversions where we're looking at um, you know, converting Celsius um, from Fahrenheit, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, 84 degrees Fahrenheit, and we see 22 and 29 respectively. Here's converting to Kelvin. Okay. Well, let's end there and I'll do part two shortly.